Hi everybody, thanks for watching this week's Bible study. This is going to be our almost last week in the 28 Days to Know Him Bible Reading Plan. We are going to finish off next week with James 1. It's going to be our last study. Then I'm going to take a, a break for a couple of weeks only because I'm going to be really busy trying to plant my fall garden and I'm obsessed with getting that done correctly. But I will be doing a couple of Bible verses during the week, short Bible verses. Uh, more of being led by the spirit of what God wants me to talk to you about that pertains to uh, the word of God and what's happening in the world today and not necessarily a Bible study. And then from there, I'm not sure where we're going to go. So if you have any suggestions, let me know and I will consider it. All right, today we are going to be in Colossians 3 and 4, and in chapter 2 of Colossians, we learn that Paul exposes um, in that chapter reasons for self-denial. In chapter 3, Paul also explains what Christians' behaviors should be like after they take on this new nature once you receive Christ, and how this new nature it within us shapes us uh, more to be how, how we should be more Christ-like. It's, it's something natural that just happens inside of us. It's a shedding of our old internal ways as we start to develop new ways that are connected with God because now we are directly connected with God and we start to take on these loving, forgiving qualities that affect our nature and um, they just fill our soul with so many wonderful things. So with that said, let's get into today's uh, Bible study on Colossians 3 and 4. So get yourself a glass of something to drink like I have here. I have a glass of peppermint water, which is one of my favorites right now during the heat of the summer. And let's share the word today. All right, verse number one. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Verse number two, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So this is a really good verse for me and I underlined it because this is exactly where my life is being led to right now. I've, I've talked about it several times that God is leading me in the spirit and showing me and I, and I, it's, it's when I tell you he's showing me, it becomes pronounced things that are in the world that I participated in, things that I liked. I'll give you an example, going shopping. I was obsessed with shopping. I love shopping. I mean, I would have QVC on, I would have HSN, I would have shopping all the time. And I had lots of stuff that I had to get rid of before I moved here. And now I don't want to go shopping. And those are videos that are coming as I start talking to you about some of the things that are happening here on the homestead. And and of course, everything on my homestead is because I'm being led by God to do this. And I've been led by God from the past. But I'll talk more about that in those other types of videos. But this is exactly what he's showing me. That a lot of the things that I had my eyes and affection fixated on in the past, they're no longer in my heart. I don't really care for them. And sometimes I'm like, I can't believe that I was that's shallow that I like that or this or that or whatever, you know? So there's a definite change in my nature that has come as a result of this connection that I have with God. And I feel so much at peace and happier now because I never felt like I filled that void. It was always something about shopping and I'd get something and then it's the next thing and it's the next thing. And now it's like, I don't need anything. I'm content with what I have. I mean, I have old stuff. And I am content with that. I'm content with old clothes. I'm content with old shoes. I don't need the latest fashion trend. But anyway, let's get into the notes for this verse. So we are told that we have to set our sights on the realities of heaven to put those in priority in our daily lives. And we should have little desire for worldly pleasure. And that's what I'm saying, that my desire is no longer in those worldly things. And I'm noticing so many more. So this is going to be our anecdote for materialism when we come to Christ. We are going to really start to 
realize that we want to separate from the world and if we talk if we ask god and i do that too because i'm like okay you want me to separate from the world how am i going to do this show me how and he does he connects through my holy spirit and he starts to develop these desires in me or desires that i don't want anymore and i put them away so you have to go to him in prayer and in conversation with him and he when you ask him show me he will do that it's not going to happen in one day. For some people, it might. But for me, it's been a progression. And I'm still changing. And this is going to be over and over and over. My changes are going to be occurring. And I'm going to be seeing different things. But this is one of the most strongest things that I've noticed in the last few months that he's really changed in me. So anyway, that's going to be our anecdote when we go to Christ uh, against materialism. Um, because we're always going to be searching for God's perspective and we want to avoid sensuality. That's the trigger that tempts us to the things of this world is that sensuality. That's why you see everything on television, pretty much everything has to do with the senses. With something that's sensual, it's either sexually sens sensual or it has to do with you know flavor or something that has to do with the senses that's going to entice us. Those are the things that happen all the time. So. Anyway, let's go to number three. So ver verse number three, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So this is meaning that we are concealed and safe with Christ and it gives us future hope also, but as a present fact. So it's like a promise that he's telling us now but our future is secure when we accept that and live that through faith. Because you can't be one of these Christians that are like, oh, you know, this and this and that and whatever. Oh, this is going to happen, whatever. You've got to always have faith. See, the thing is, I'm prepping for whatever happens in society. But I'm not prepping because I'm afraid. I'm prepping because I'm being led in the spirit to prepare so that I can have those physical things that I need because God is not going to, I'm gonna wake up in the morning and there's gonna be buckets of food out there for me. He could do that if he wanted to, but in reality, he wants me to do the work because it's gonna strengthen me. I'm gonna build faith. Every time I'm doing the work, I'm doing the land, I'm doing the garden, I'm preparing. I know I'm living in faith because I can do so much. The rest I know is up to him because there's so many things that can come in my mind that could happen you know, I could run out of water, I can run out of food, whatever, because this thing can go for years. I can't go past what my limits are. The rest is me putting faith in God because I have limits, but he's limitless. And that I know in my heart. Okay, next one is verse number four. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Five, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth this one i also underlined so pay attention so these members that we have to mortify are fornication uncleanliness inordinate affection evil conspicuous and covetedness which is idolatry so let me break down for you a couple of things here he's breaking down here a major um topic which is sexual perversion most of these things we can say are pretty much sexual perversion the bible is consistent on the side to heterosexual monogamous marriage it is consistent that it it sides on those three things anything else that doesn't side on that is considered in the bible as sexual perversion and the only way with those three things, heterosexual, monogamous marriage, is the way to true sexual fulfillment and lifelong commitment because that is God's way. It's going to be, it's going to be a har harmonious love and relationship because it's not based on any type of perversions, okay? The rest is going to be dangerous because sexual perversions, what they do is they're going to drain your energy and turn your heart away from God because you are going to be more focused on the perversions than you are on God. And this is the problem with a lot of people, you know, that they like their sins. 
they go to church on Sunday, but they still like their sins. They think that that is enough or they've convinced themselves or they go to churches that kind of convince them that that is what it is. So they, they choose those kind of churches, but that's not the Bible. That's not what's in the word. I'm reading you the word. I'm not picking and choosing things. I'm reading you the word. Number six, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. So this is like a cosmic curse because this is now God's judgment when you are disobedient and you do those things we just talked about. It's going to bring a curse on you because there are certain things you're not supposed to be doing. There are evil and i'm not talking about the word evil is getting kind of soft nowadays because people see evil but this is truly i mean evil is something that is not just in the physical but it's what's in the spirit of this evil that is true evil and those things are according to god those things that you're doing of all of those things that i talked about before that are not that are not heterosexual monogamous marriage everything other than that is going to be judged by God. And they can bring curses. Number seven, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them, when we lived in them. So now that we were in Christ, we walked in those ways at one point, but now we don't live in them anymore because now we're in Christ, but we lived in those things. Those are the things we did. And the wonderful thing about this verse is no, that he's preparing us to let us know we used to do that, but now we're in Christ, we don't. So there's almost like a, oh, and then there's a, you know, just almost like a sigh, like saying, yes, you know, that shame comes up on you that you think, yeah, I did those things. But then there's that, ah, where you're like, now I'm in Christ, you know, I feel good about myself. So number eight, but now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Nine, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. So lying destroys trust and we have to be committed always to telling the truth. And lying is a big thing nowadays. Everybody seems to be lying because a lot of people don't believe in God. So they have nothing they don't care. They don't believe in judgment. They don't believe in cosmic per curses. But the problem is if you're a Christian, you can't take on those ways because it does happen. The Bible is telling us that those things are going to affect us. If we're lying, if we're doing all of the blasphemy and all of the things that are happening out there that the world is doing right now. A lot of our politicians, this is what they do, but they don't care about God. They, 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 they lie to you. They, they show that they're in front of a, Bible, of a church or they have a book or they want to receive communion. I don't know what's in your heart. That's just a ceremony. If you're not practicing it daily, 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 then you, know, you don't look like what the Bible is showing me a person that's Christ-like should be like. Number 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him so notice how it says that we're putting on this new personality this new behavior these new attitudes because we're a new person we're a new man because we are renewed in knowledge because we know and our knowing isn't just mental our knowing is also when this and our holy spirit connect and they become one and they and it and, and it just resonates inside of you it's like you know, when you have a plug and you don't plug it in, all of a sudden we're plugged in and the light shines in us because that's exactly what this, this, this new persona is that we take on when we go to Christ. So this, this was part of the old ways of life before Christ. And now with Christ, we rid ourselves of all of those evil practices that he was talking about before. And remember that our conduct should also match our faith. That's how we know that we are walking in the word and with Christ. This learning is going to be lifelong and we have to be obedient 
And there should be no reason for drifting away from Christ when you are obedient. That's why obedience is important because you have to be obedient in order for you not to drift away. If your friends are calling you, hey, let's go to the nightclub. And we'll, and then you go to the nightclub one night. And then the next night you go to the nightclub again when they invite you. And now you're having drinks. And then the next night you're having smoking something and then now you're doing drugs and this is how it happens it's progression because the devil uses people to get you off track and to drift away from christ and we have to be very careful now at this point when we have this new nature we have to be careful that people don't try to tempt us away from christ because the the thing is they see our change and they don't like it they want the old person back because they feel judged they feel they feel conviction when they see that we've changed but they don't want to change so they want to change us back and we don't want to change back 11 when there is neither greek nor jew circumcision nor uncircumcision barbarian scythian bond nor free but christ is all and in all so what he's trying to explain here is that churches should not allow barriers between its members and it shouldn't do it through social wealth, gender, educational levels or race. And I'll tell you that I went to a church back in Fort Lauderdale when I lived there it was a big church. And that's exactly what I've talked about. There were people that were specifically assigned to the front row because they were the ones that gave more money to the church or they were important or whatever. That is not that is not what should be happening in the church because it's telling us in the Bible that those things shouldn't be happening in the church. So if you're seeing those things in the church that you're going to, then you are there then those people those those churches are not following the Bible or they're picking and choosing what they want to obey in the Bible. You cannot pick and choose what you want to obey in the Bible. You either obey and live in faith the entire Bible or you don't. It's simple as that. Number 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness, of mind, meekness, and long suffering. So Paul here is offering a strategy for Christians to live by daily by imitating Christ's attitude to forgive. It starts with forgiveness because when we come to Christ, we ask for forgiveness and we're forgiven. And the same applies to us when we walk in the world, we also have to be forgiven with other people. So let love guide your life. Allow the peace of Christ to rule your heart. You always have to be thankful. You have to keep in God's word always to prevent you from drifting away. We just talked about drifting away. Because we have to live as a representative of Yahushua. So that means people are now going to be looking and they're going to look to pick at you. They're going to look to say something about what you do or what. Because they have an idea or they make up these ideas in their mind. You know, we're not going to be perfect we might say a bad word we might call somebody a name because they're attacking us or saying something and we go back to our worldly ways but over time those things start to go away because we catch ourselves we're like oh i said this word i shouldn't have done that you know i should have done it this way instead i should have done this this way instead and that's how we change when we know something that we did in the past and we're doing it again and we rectify it, we acknowledge that we did it, and we say, next time this happens, I'm not gonna do this. And now it's in your mind and you won't do it again. This is how you change, because you have the love of Christ in your heart. Verse number 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So this is telling us that we have to forgive others and let God worry over the wrongs. That's it. Just let God worry over it. God will take care of the wrongs of the person. You just have to forgive. 14. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. So you get to choose to live in peace. 
because it's not going to be a feeling. It's going to be more of a need that you want to serve others. And whenever you have to make choices in life, difficult choices, you always want to make the choice that it's going to be more on the peaceful side and that allows that peace to rule in your heart and in your soul. That's how you know you're making the right choice. Number 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. So the New Testament had not been written yet and many of the stories told of Christ were actually presented as stories with music. And that is why music was so important and still important in worship today. Discontented people are going to always dwell on what's wrong. And unthankful people are going to worship God, which opens the heart to peace and enables love. And this is why it's wonderful to sing because that means that you have a contented heart and not discontented. And sometimes when you are discontented, or having a bad day if you listen to worship music it make it reverses your mood it's, it's happened to me and I'll turn it on and it totally changed my mood where I feel like I can reflect now on the better side or man I'm 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 not in such a bad place it's not such a bad thing I can do this I can do that you know and I feel so much better and it uplifts me number 17 and whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, Yahushua, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. By the way, I'm saying Yahushua because that is his Hebrew name. You call him Jesus, but I like to call him by his Hebrew name. 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as it is fit in the Lord. 19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Back in the day, then the Roman custom, the head of the family sometimes would not treat his wife with respect and love. But now the husbands under Christ, he serves the wife, putting aside his own interests for his wife's interests. And the wife will never undermine her husband's leadership. That is the way that it is under Christ. And there are Romans that did come to Christ during all of that stuff that happened a while back. So they were able to change also and respect their wives because of coming to Christ. Because it changes your behavior and your attitude. You can forgive and you can love each other and fix the relationship under Christ. 20, children obey your parents in all things for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. That's very important. We keep getting verses like that. The family is unity is so important. The Bible in the New Testament, it keeps talking about it. You know, it keeps telling us, you know, the kids have to respect the parents. They have to be obedient to the parents. You can't go from being disobedient to your parents to being obedient to God. You know, it, it doesn't work. If you're not obedient with your parents, how are you going to be obedient to God? You have to be obedient to your parents. Now, if your parents are evil or something else, that's a different thing. But you also have to be forgiving. It doesn't matter if your parents are bad. You also have to have a forgiving heart. 21, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. 22, servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And of course, we have to have verses of, about servants and slaves in those days because that was happening. It was happening in Rome. There were lots of slaves and these 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 things had to be talked about in those days 23 and whatsoever ye do do it heartily as to the lord and not unto men so god gave us work to do and we have to regard that work as an act of worship and by having this attitude it's going to take away the boredom of many jobs when you realize that you have to do the best that you can and put your whole heart into whatever job you got. Because first of all, you should be grateful that you have a job, right? And try to do the best that you can at that job. And feel gratitude for having that job. 24. Knowing that of the Lord, ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. 25. 
but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. We're going to go now into four, into Colossians 4. Now verse number one, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. So in this respect, we're going to turn it around for us, and we have to understand it because masters can be employers. And that we have to re be able to understand that if we have employees, we should treat these employees fairly and with respect at all times. Verse number two, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. So here again, it's telling us continue in prayer. Always praying, always giving thanks. What I said a few minutes about, if you're discontent, turn on some music and start to reflect on gratitude for enjoying the music that is going to lift, that lifts you up. Find find songs and hymns or music that's going to lift you up, and have that praying spirit, wanting to be away from this discontentment that you have. Three, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. I love this part right here. This is so in my life right now. This is just to me. This is poetic because it says. Open unto us a door of utterance. That tells me that when he speaks to me, it's so subtle. It doesn't even come from the brain. It's just something that feels. He just gives it to me inside and I just, there's a knowing in there. That small door of utterance that he gives me. And he says to speak the mystery of Christ which I am also in bonds. That mystery, th those things that you can't even comprehend but all of a sudden it just boom you cut me it mentally you can't it's just something that comes from the spirit there's the mental comprehension that we do when we go to school and we learn and there's that holy spirit that gives you that comprehension i don't know if, if maybe some of you have never experienced that but that's another thing that happens to you when you become a born again believer is the holy spirit will give you that mm, knowing yep Put a stamp on it. I don't need to think about it. I just know because truth is truth and it's just going to resonate from inside, coming from somewhere deep inside of you. It's definitely an utterance. Number four, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Five, walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. So this means that we have to live wisely among those that are not believers but still make every opportunity to minister to others. We have to be courteous. So this is why when you're at work, this is a great opportunity for you if you're having other people that you're working with, that they see the change in you, that you are now doing your job happily, enjoying it, you know, and they see the change in you and now they want the same thing. So it's an opportunity for other people for you to also minister to other people and tell them what's happened and change them as well. Verse number six, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how ye ought to answer every man. So here it is, an opportunity for you to minister to others, even at work. Seven, all my state shall Tychius declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Eight, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. Nine, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you received commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. 11, and Yahushua, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision. These only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Verse number 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always, laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may find, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Epaphras founded the Colossian church. So this Epaphras had founded the Colossian church 
who helped the church to stay together despite all the problems. He was a big influence to try to keep the church together there. 13, for I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laruchia and them in Hierapolis. Can't always uh, pronounce it perfectly, but that doesn't mean we can't go on. 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. So here we know that Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he also wrote the Book of Acts. He accompanied Paul on his three missionary journeys, and he sat with him in the Roman prison. Demas, who he mentions here, was faithful but Demas eventually fell away to the ways of the world. 15. Salute the brethren which are in Lodikia and Nymphas and the church which is, which is in his house. So I, I want to talk here about these Christians who met in homes. The, the church buildings didn't come in into the third century. When I'm done with this Bible verse, I'm going to talk to you about something that inspired me to mention in this uh, verse number 15. Verse number 16, and when this epistle is read among you, cause that to be read also in the church of the Lodicians, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Lodicia. 17, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. 18, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds, grace be with you. Amen. Paul dictated this his letters and then he ended with a small note in his own handwriting to assure the false teachers that were actually writing letters in Paul's name, but it wasn't Paul who was writing those letters. So that's why he had to change. He had to dictate a lot of the, the stuff, but he always finished it off with a personal note signed by him. So these false teachers, what they wanted to do was destroy the faith of God, of Christ. They wanted to undermine his humanity and his divinity because Christ is the Lord in the spiritual as well in the physical world. And it is through a clear connection with Yahushua, who you call Jesus, that he is going to be our main source every single time. So I want to go back to 15. When I read this, I thought to myself, okay, here is a perfect example in 15. It tells us that Christians didn't, didn't have these buildings that we have now where people go and hear sermons. So I want you to reflect this week on what exactly, when I read you that verse and I told you that the, the, they were meeting and the church which is in the house, okay? What does that picture look like to you? So for me, it looks like a bunch of people who are happy, content, so happy to see each other because they know each other, catching up on different things, and then they just sit down, whether it's in a table, on the floor, out in the patio, I don't know, some, wherever, and they're just content to hear the word. But this is the catch. I don't think anybody comes there with a prepared sermon during those days. I think they just take the Word of God, the Old Testament, and they read it. They read the verses. They read the promises. They read many of the things that are in there. And they just sit there and they they read the they, they read the scriptures they talk about the scriptures and what it means there's people that probably there's people that that are more studied in the scripture than others but they don't pick a sermon like most churches do now and twist it they give you the exempt to me anyway i think that they, it was it was more like an actual bible study it's more like really let's read that all of that and understand what was going on in the time the behaviors of the people what were they doing what God was saying to them, what was saying to the apostles to write down. That is what I'm trying to do here. And I hope that God is pleased with what I've done so far is giving you the actual word, doing the research, finding out what all of this really means for its time, the history, because I believe that's important. I believe that once we know, it's kind of like we visualize and it goes into our heart. And now we understand 
how we're supposed to be, what our attitudes are, and what are the changes that are going to happen to us as a result of being born again. Churches that I've been to, they don't talk about this stuff. They'll take one verse and they'll spend a whole hour on that. But they're picking and choosing. And a lot of the things that I read to you today about, you know, the, the things you're not supposed to be doing, they don't talk about. And it has to be talked about. Because if we are Christians, we have to reflect that to the world. And this is why you have so many problems in our world. Because the churches have failed. Christians are not reflecting the true word of God into their lives. And I hope that you can reflect on that this week and try to understand that. And find yourself, really pick a church that's going to honor the word of God. You know, and I know people say, you know, I don't want to do a whole Bible study. I don't want to learn. Well, you can either do it here with me or you can go do it on by yourself. Or you can go pick a church and they're not going to tell you all of the behaviors and attitudes because they don't want you to do that. You know, they don't want to insult you by telling you, here, let me go here. They have to make money. They don't want to go and tell you that you can't fornicate, that you're unclean, that you have inordinate affection, that you have evil concupiscence in your life, you're, you're coveting, and you have a idolatry. They don't sit down and tell you this stuff. Because a lot of people will be sitting in the audience and they'll be offended. And they won't come back to the church. Because something is going to be inside of them that's going to convict them. Not the person is judging them. It's their own connection with God. Because God is trying to tell them something. And they have a choice there. They can even come back and learn if that, if that Bible study or that church is telling them the truth of the Bible. Or they decide not to come back. And what do most people do? They don't come back because they love their sins. And in their mind, okay, in their mind, they have made excuses for what Christian life should be like. Because they are copying the Christians that are in the world. And with that, I leave you till next week. I will see you back here for James 1. If you enjoyed this study, if you enjoy the effort that I take, to put out these Bible studies. I do appreciate that you give it a thumbs up. And I will see you next week. I hope you have a wonderful week. God bless. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. Thanks for watching.